Ephesians chapter 6. If you came here and don't have a Bible, but we'd love to have you follow along, you'll find the page we're on to be page 1149 on one of those Bibles underneath the chairs. And a message titled Raising Christian Kids. I'll give you a quick update to pray about. We're with, uh, I, we, some of us met with representatives from American Christian Credit Union on Saturday, and they're still continuing to move forward about uh, loaning us for the church building. They came out and saw the church building, took pictures and stuff like that. So keep that in prayer. Even as I open from the psalm, it said, your wife will be a fruitful vine, your children around your plant, uh, like, like all trees, all the plants around your table. Because um, they'll always get there when you put something on the table. You ever notice that about kids? They, they, just, they magically appear. Um, we look at what the Lord has shared with us in Ephesians, and this is to Christians, believers, and it told us to be ye being filled constantly, consistently, continually with the Holy Spirit. This is a Spirit-filled relationship that the husband and the wife that we looked at recently were talked about, it. now it's with the children and the parents. It's in Scripture ordained that way, as well. I put God's plans can't be improved. And we have a lot of culture and society telling us a lot of things about what makes up a family, what makes up a marriage, what makes up a couple. But even from the very beginning, Jesus reiterated for them in Mark 10, 6, that God made them male and female. And that for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and what God has put together, let no man put asunder. And then he goes to, and then he talks about, so husbands and wives first, and then he talks about kids. And he said, you know, in that chapter, let the little children come to me. Jesus truly does love the little children. They are precious in it, black, yellow, red, and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. When I first wrote that song, I remember it became a hit quite quickly. Um, it's just the truth, and that's his plan, and you see it time and time again, the husband and the wife, and then he talks about children, he talks about children many times in the scripture. And Jesus is serious about not stumbling little ones. He says, when they were fighting about who'd be the greatest, he, he, he said, be like a child, have childlike faith and everything else, and he brings the child as an illustration. And he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him where millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That seems pretty serious, doesn't it? Amen. I mean, that's like a worst case scenario that we probably could come up with. A millstone, big old, around your neck, deep in the sea. And Jesus is going, yeah, you prefer that option. That's serious. Over how I would deal with those who don't want to... Uh, Take my word seriously. And of course, in all of this, I'll tell you, Jesus forgives and his grace is greater than any sin committed because that's what the Bible tells us. But this truth of children, a younger generation, babes in the faith, not wanting them to stumble, anything else, or bring an offense against them, is he's quite serious about it. And this subject of raising children one of the biggest reasons I want to see the, the church get built is so we can have a, that daycare there and really influence the next generation and the younger children to know the Lord and to follow after the Lord. To be blessed. Children are a blessing. That's what Scripture says. And he said in Genesis, it said, you know, he blessed them. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. In Deuteronomy 28.4, it says, Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. Esau saw Jacob coming with the tribe with him. And he says, what's this tribe? And he said, the children, in Genesis 33, 5, whom God has graciously given. If by his grace, children are a gift. They're a, they're a blessing, a heritage. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Psalms 127 says, and the Lord has to build the house for it to really be blessing, or we labor in vain. So it is kind of a favorite subject. Lisa and I, we love kids. We love our kids. We love grandkids. And I like to talk about it because uh, we're pretty much done. 
<laughs> raising kids. And so now it's, it's a little funner to talk about it, right? We're not in the, in the mix of it. It's a great thing when your kids, you are blessed by the adults they are, though. I tell you, there's nothing greater. We, it doesn't ever say in the Bible that I need to be a friend to my kids, but we are to be parents to our kids. And when we, they grow up, there's a, a friendship there. So for those that don't know, I'll just put it out there and welcome any that are watching online as well, that we have, uh, we have five children, we have uh, two in-laws, we have four grandbabies, and uh, our in-laws are like our children, and we're, we're close family, we're taking a vacation again together, all 13 of us, a baker's dozen, in, uh, in, a, in a month, and we will all return without killing each other, and blessed by the experience. And it's a lot or, or easier as they get older, and to be a grandparent, say, well, that's... Uh, Okay, there's your kid. And uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's a little easier. But in between our fourth and our fifth, uh, we had a miscarriage. And we believe scripturally that baby is in heaven, a child awaiting uh, a reunion with her family. We believe it was a girl. Um, but here, here's the deal. What a, what a tragic thing for siblings or parents to be missing in heaven, or children to be missing of parents in heaven. We want everybody in heaven together, especially in our immediate family. And so, as I speak about these things, God's order even, his plan that can't be improved upon, uh, culture says one thing, and it really doesn't matter to the truth. And the truth is God is the one who instructs mankind. And this whole thing of child raising is an interesting thing if you've never done it and you thought about it prior to it happening, there is a perception and there is a reality. And it might not be exactly what you were expecting when they said, have kids, they'll be fun, there'll be some <laughs> trying moments, and even as a grandparent, sometimes it's not exactly what you thought it might be. And they will change your lives. That is for sure. How can I put this? You will never sleep again. And that's uh, the way it might seem sometimes when you're in the throes of it. You will learn patience from your children. Sometimes it's just waiting for them to tell a story and they're going around in their, their circles. And you will think at times they have a conspiracy against you, especially when you have five of them. And it seems like you just turn around and they've made a mess out of everything, and sometimes they seem like they just have their plans, and they wait till you're finally asleep to, to disrupt things or start screaming. And uh, <laughs> you think you're putting them to sleep, and they put you to sleep. And sometimes the love that we have for them doesn't seem to be answered back. It seems to be unrequited love sometimes, doesn't it? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a child is a curly, dimpled lunatic. <laughs> and I believe there's some truth there about their craziness. And well, <clears throat> society says one thing, culture. Remember, in this day, all these things he said about husbands and wives and the way women were treated in a male-dominated, strong society because of just physical strength, the way that... They were treated was horrible, and so much stuff that you have in the Bible runs so counterculture of what was going on in that day, and it's a, it's a heavenly truce. Now, some people, when you talk about marriage or something like that, they point to mistakes that people that even loved God made, and they were historically recorded in Scripture, just because David had all these wives, he did opposite of what the scripture had told kings to do. Just because they can, they sure shouldn't have. So it's historically recorded, but a biblical marriage is what uh, is spoken of in Genesis and Jesus reiterated in the Gospels. So culture in this day would treat children horribly. They would treat them almost like property, some of them. And we know people treat children horribly horribly sometimes, and if you were, uh, you're an adult and you were a child who was treated horribly, uh, apologize for that. Uh, it might, 
how horrible you thought it was sometimes as we're growing up at 15 isn't nearly as bad when we <laughs> or we're 25 or 35 that we thought we got raised and we were all all every parent was going to do a better job than they were parented and uh, it doesn't always turn out as great as we thought it would um, if I had one thing to do over in our child raising it was be to give them more Jesus and we gave them Jesus but we, I would give them more Jesus than than we did. So right off the bat, let's read these four, four verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And just as I stated, God has the best plan for marriage. I want to look at the end of verse 1 first before we look at the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 6 and that is the statement for this is right again there's culture and society that say that the only thing that's wrong is saying something is wrong about what they think is right mm. and the truth is that there is a right and a wrong just start with that premise right there Isaiah 55 excuse me, 520 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them. That's a horrible place to be, to turn everything upside down and say this is okay when it's not, to say this doesn't matter when it does. And culture is getting very gray on so many issues that are clearly black and white scripturally. What is one of them here? That it's right for children to obey and to honor their parents. Now in this messed up right and wrong world, it's funny with all the double standards that they are. If you remember Lois Lerner, who uh, in 2014 has this, in her position said, well, we lost the emails. I, I plead the fifth. Right, we don't know what happened. All those emails that they were looking at because it came out that they were targeting certain people. Now, And uh, a pundit, a cartoonist, has the picture here of saying, and because of a series of complicated crashes, Lois Lerner and six of her staffers lost all of the emails from the relevant time period forever. The end. It's a fairy tale. And it has a picture of even a kid in a cartoon going, I, well, I don't buy that. There's a lot of things that are excused by some who are perpetuating sin. Well, what do I mean? Let's turn this around. It's tax time. Go ahead and tell them, well, you just lost all your records. You don't have, you don't know where you're, see how, how good that works for you. So it's double standards. There's, there's a, a mixed up world, but there is a right and a wrong. So that's just the premise right off the bat. And I say that the Bible tells us what's right and wrong. And it says here, children, obey your parents. So this is one of the, the few places that's given to an address of children. It's like this portion of the Bible is written to children, to kids. Now, even though I said oh, we're pretty much done, there, there's a reality that your kids are always your kids. I get that. Um, even when they're grown and they're, they're adults. But throughout Scripture, it tells us of different instances in a few spots, just a few spots that is specifically addressed to children like this here, to kids. And so I put, you know, it like, excuse me, I'm talking to you. It's children who this is, given to specifically children like in Deuteronomy 516 honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land of the, the, the Lord your God it is giving you time and again when it speaks to children it speaks to them and it tells them a couple of things to honor and obey and it's like are you listening because again Jesus reiterated a command and said 
Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. Now, could you imagine if that was carried out today? The population would be diminishing quickly. There is a lack of respect in our society that's huge. There is a, a problem that's out there where it's not enforced for respect and obedience. And kids, children, need to be told this. It's one of the, the Ten Commandments. Like I said, the first one with the promise, obey. Obey. Rebellion, it's like the, the sin of witchcraft. It's a horrible thing. So kids, you have one job. And it's in like two parts. It's to honor and it's to obey. He's this technon, the, the word he uses here, Greek doesn't, it, it speaks of those that are toddling to grade school to teenagers. It's not just the little tiny ones. It uses a broader scoping word in the Greek to, to speak to those different stages of life. But it starts in the toddler stage. It says in Leviticus this, every one of you shall revere his father and his mother. His mother and his father. Any of you ever have a job that you did and your boss told you to do something and you weren't too keen on your boss at all? You rolled your eyes, you talked smack, you didn't care for them at all. Outside of the workplace, you would never, ever want to talk to them, basically. That uh, attitude is not to be expressed to parents at all. I realize not everybody's had great parents, but we are to honor. So it's action and it's attitude. What is the action? Obey. Do what they say. Lisa's, one of her catchphrases for a lot of years was that slow obedience is no obedience. I'll, I'll do it. I'll get to it. Later. 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 Tomorrow. Tomorrow. I love you. Tomorrow. It's only a day away. And that, that's kids' natural vent is to do that. To procrastinate, to not do it right away. And they'll do that to the point where they, they never get it done. And if you want it done now, and it's important, it's like gas in your car, right? You don't want to put that off too long because you run out. So both of those things are important. They're called to revere, to respect, to honor. Honor their name, honor the, the, your family name. Not to disrespect. Disrespect is huge in today's society. Culture has a whole different thing, and, and it's raised a, a, a lot of brats. It really has. Um, I have this few articles that I'm reading stuff, you know. It's Benjamin Spock, his, his book, Baby and Child Care, uh, he said later that I, he admits he takes part of the blame. He says this, inability to be firm is, to my mind, the commonest problem of parents in America today. He said, the resulting brattiness of America's children, at least in part, is due to the experts, the child psychiatrists, psychologists, teachers, social workers, and pediatricians like myself. In the 20th century, parents have been persuaded that these are the only people who know for sure how children should be managed. This is the cool, cruel deprivation that we professionals have imposed on mothers and fathers of course, we did it with the best of intentions. We didn't realize until it was too late how our know-it-all attitude was undermining the self-assurance of parents. God knows what he was doing, and any parents, that is your child that God knew was coming. He has given us, as parents, a stewardship of that child. The only person that loves that child or should love that child more than the parent is Jesus Christ. He loves them. And so he should dictate by a spirit-leading biblical life what is best for that child. Yet the world tries to tell us other things. It tries to tell us, for instance, 
that the last thing you should ever do is spank a child, many people say. And yet the Bible doesn't say that. Spanking should be done with a, with a calm heart, not in anger. It should be done uh, with, I, I believe why it says to do it, you know, with an instrument is because the hands are made for love. They should be, you should show them love right afterwards. But sometimes, especially, we have three boys, three males, <laughs> three rebellious in their nature. And there was some times where, and all those things should be done, the taking them out of, of temptation away from them, bringing them out of the temptation area, this and that. But sometimes they just need to learn obedience. And sometimes what speaks to them is through a little sting on their backside when you have to eventually get to that. Now, I stopped spanking Zach a year ago. He's finally got <laughs> to that point where... No, of course, there's an age where it doesn't work and everything like that. Uh, that's, you know, it's for the each child, and I think you should be prayerful. But when, when you have a, a, a four-year-old that knows exactly what they're doing, and they are rebellious and everything else, you do them a favor by teaching them obedience and teaching them to honor. And it is biblical. Spock said a lot of things um, that he... Uh, Later, you know, definitely had some regrets about. This, this I just got, this is uh, February, last month, came out, uh, this article. And it has this picture, I don't know if you can see it in the back or whatever. But this picture of this little child throwing a fit, basically. And it says here, just a naughty child or suffering from ODD. Oh, they've got another name and initials for stuff, for kids. Instead of calling them B-R-A-T. <laughs> and it says, nearly every child in, in Cornwall, it's, it's from the UK, would admit arguing with their parents and having occasional tantrums if things don't go their way. But a growing number of children are now being diagnosed with a medical condition for such behavior. What experts say could lead to mental health problems later in life. Yeah, it will hurt them later. That's why it says it'll go well with you. And it says... Oppositional Defiant Disorder, commonly known as ODD, is characterized when children frequently argue and disobey adults who look after them. That is growing in our society. And what does Timothy say? In the last days, there's going to be perilous times, and one of the attributes are that children are going to be disobedient to parents. And there is huge disobedience. There is huge warning flags. Had a parent speaking with us just recently that said kids in their, their class of little grade schoolers, primary grade school area, first, second, third grade, kids were bringing in their, their media devices, and they were playing Grand Theft Auto on it. The, grow, the quickest growing number of those using pornography in our society today are 11 to 13 year olds. There's huge problems out there. And so, and society is, is reaping the consequences of not following things in a biblical manner and not even recognizing that there is a right and wrong and not even telling kids and asking them if they're listening about obedience, and not honoring. And the Bible says this time and time again, like I said, and Jesus did it. I find it interesting that, that in the story of Jesus, one of the very, you know, this very uh, isolated this, this incident that just give us this one right before he's a teenager incident in the Bible, it says that Jesus, when he w went down in Luke 2.51, when he went down with them and they came to Nazareth and he was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in, in her heart. It means he was obedient. He was submissive to them. Well, when did this happen? You know the story. They're traveling. They're going up for the Passover. Jesus is there talking with the, the scribes and the learned people and they are blown away by his, his intelligence, by his insightfulness. And as he discusses with them these things, they, they're blown away. And then they finally find him. And he said, well, I had to be about my father's business. And then he was subject to them. To who? Joseph and Mary. He took on a role, and Scripture gives us evidence of that, that Jesus obeyed. 
Not just his heavenly father, but in that position at that time, at that age, he obeyed his earthly parents. Who were these earthly parents? These earthly parents were people that lost the Messiah for three days. That is bad parenting. You are not supposed to lose the Messiah of the world for three days. And go, where to go? Where to go? I thought you had him. I thought I got him. And, and we've lost our kid before, one of them, uh, a couple of them. They got lost. Not for three days. But I tell you this, child, as we're all children, we still have parents alive, that every teenager has been raised by an imperfect parent. And Jesus didn't say, well, I'm not going to listen to you. Oh, you guys lost me. You guys stink. And you actually had a preteen that did know more than his parents. You got a lot of them now that think they do. But he did. And he still submitted. And there is no age limit to this. I, I, I've had people over the years, 20 years of ministry, and they'll come in and they'll say, what are you going to do? You need to take, help take care of, you need to take care of my, my parent. You need to give this to my parent. You need to pay this rent for my parent. And I've shared this with a few people over the years. It says here, but a widow uh, that has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. I said, no, you know what really pleases God? What are, what are you doing? And sometimes there are people that I've already done enough, I can't do anymore, I don't want to do it, over their aged parents. A lack of honor and respect and love. And the, the truth is, it's not easy and it can get very tough to obey sometimes. And there is no age limit. When Jesus got upset with them, when that scripture I gave you earlier, where he talks about, you know, the commandment to be put to death, it was because they, they were making an excuse and they, were, they came up with the word korban, and they'd say, I don't have to help my parents because this is korban, it's holy to the Lord, so I enjoy my couch. My parents don't have a couch, that's their problem. And they were dishonoring the ones who had raised them. We are not to forget the one who, uh, the, the mom who didn't abort, the mom who carried, the mom who ah! transitioned, and birthed and gave life to a child. And the dad who hopefully came home and worked a little bit. <laughs> but he still did that, at least. And you know, what I'll say is, too, is you'll thank us later. Any kids that hear this, any the parents to reiterate this for your kids, they will thank us later. And if they don't learn submission and obedience, they will learn it somewhere else eventually or suffer all the consequences of it. You know, they'll, they'll learn it uh, by going job to job to job. They'll go, learn it by not graduating school and getting kicked out of a school and everything else. That's how they'll learn it. They'll learn it the hard way. They'll learn it in jail where they have to obey like crazy, some of them. And I've seen the consequences of this. And it's by God's grace and he can change all that. I got, I got booted out of a lot of high schools in two and a half years. And I know that what rebellion and disobedience, it does not bed you well in the long run. Esther, used by God, she's got a book in the Bible with her name on it. Esther had not made known her, her kindred or her people. She kept her mouth shut as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. And the best favor we can do is teach that obedience at a, at a young age. But it did her well, didn't it? She learned this principle of obedience, submission, humility, honor. And it's not something that you just lose. I am so grateful for the ability, by God's grace, given that I could honor my father in the last years of his life. The Recently, when Caleb got his license, and he... he the lady who's not the easiest lady known at the MVD for giving out good scores gave him 100%. But that, that, and I also like took him on the route because you can get the route and just try to set him up for success. But 
what she said to Lisa and I that, really, that warmed our heart way more than whatever his test score was, was that what a respectful, nice young man, and you sure don't see that anymore like you used to. And that, that blessed our heart, and that's by the grace of God, but that's taking biblical principles and, and living them out. See, you're going to pay some now, parents, or we're going to pay more later. It's the same with the kids. They're going to pay the hard way, and we'll pay by the, the heartbreak. Like it says in Proverbs, uh, a rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left in discipline disgraces his mother. Discipline is important, and it should be taught. So that it goes well with them when they grow up, and it goes well as they grow up with the, the parent. There's a, there's a lot of given parental responsibilities that, that are given over to those that aren't called to it. To, to audio and video devices. To their peer groups. We, we need to take that responsibility. We need to correct. We need to get up off the couch. You need to make sure that they do obediently what they're supposed to do when you tell them to do it. We need consistency in raising kids. And it's repetitive and it's over and over, but it needs to be that way. It is, it's in, that ob obey there, it's in, the, it's in the present imperative. It's constant, continually obeying that should be carried out. And we are responsible, even as it says in verse 4, and you fathers... Don't provoke your children to wrath. Make them mad, teasing them, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And you pay now or you'll, you'll pay later. When somebody says to me over a small child, well, I don't know what to do with them, I think that small child, if he had your experience, your intelligence, your strength, your position, they would surely know what to do to impose their will upon you. <laughs> Correct? And it is not, and sometimes what goes for cute isn't cute when you think about the consequences of it. Throwing a fit isn't cute. Them telling you what to do, where to go, when to do it, it isn't cute. It's, it's rebellion. And A two-year-old, I guarantee you, would know what to do if they were 150 pounds and you were 20 pounds. <laughs> they would pick you up. They'd move you. They'd put you in time. They would, they would impose their will. We are called with a stewardship and a wonderful responsibility to lovingly impose our will upon them. But not knowing what to do with them, no, that's on the parent. And the sooner it gets disciplined with consistency and love and everything else, the better off everyone will be. It says there that we are not to uh, provoke them, but to bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Spiritual activity, church, Christians, if we're a Christian, should be if we have an influence in our grandkids' life, in a neighborhood kid, whatever, it should be the priority. In society, everything else wants to take the time first. Uh, everything else is more important than church, prayer, Bible reading, all, all kinds of things. But if we really believe that there, what we say we believe, that Jesus is who he says he is, that there is a heaven and a hell and everything else, there's an eternity, then how important is it that we make these things our priority? That they see that in our life is a priority. What does it look like? Um, they, they see us forgiving. They see us humble. Sometimes it means every parent should have apologized to their kids on several occasions throughout their upbringing. Sorry that I didn't act the way that the Lord would have had me act. Sorry that I didn't do the things the Lord should have had me do. Sorry that I wasn't more patient while you were telling me that story that took forever. Sorry that I didn't show you more love. Sorry that I didn't give you more of Jesus in different occasions. It says to train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, they will not depart from it. 
values are easier caught than taught. When they see that in our lives, that's a way to raise them up in the Lord. They see us being honest. They see us being honorable. I, I shared Wednesday that one of our kids realized we didn't get charged for a Coke at a fast food place. And one of our adult kids, and the first thing they did, hey, they didn't charge us. Just honesty. Just biblical principles. Obey, respect, those kind of things. Um, and and the, the biggest lunacy that I think could be out there, if we believe all this, that we say we believe. And when I, I've talked to people, they well, I'm a Christian, everything else. And they, I say, so what are you doing with raising your kids? Your kids for Christ, raising Christian kids. And, and some people I've heard say over the years, well, you know, I want them to make up their own mind. Oh, I just... And, and so like when they're two years old and they're throwing a fit, you say, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, don't, I want you to make up your own mind about fit throwing. Oh, when do you want to eat? Well, go ahead, go ahead. It's, it's, it's your choice. Um, how do you feel about crossing the street? Well, you make up your own mind how you want to cross the street, whether you want to look both ways. It's just crazy. We don't do it anywhere else and anything else in any way other. And, and then, yet with this thing that's eternal and most important, oh, we need to guide them and coerce them and encourage them and, and show them the need of Jesus above all else. These truths. We need to catch these from us. It's lunacy. To say, oh, make up your own mind. And those things, like I said, it, it, you know what? If you got a 17-year-old and they don't like the food and they throw it at you, is that cute? <laughs> That's not cute. They don't want to clean up a mess. They don't want to... No, it starts when they're young. And it's, it's exhausting. It's tiring. It's sacrificial. But it is worth it in the long run. And he said, you pay some now or you'll pay more later. I've been with too many parents, too many regrets of children in, in jail and other things like that. That God had a way better plan. Deuteronomy says, And those, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. They shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And I know kids are cute, man. God made them that way so that they live. But don't give them a free pass because of their cuteness. And like I said earlier, spiritual activity, make it the priority if we really believe that. Aria lo loves to sing already, our granddaughter. I mean, I think she has a beautiful voice. It might be off tone, off key, and crazy, but it's beautiful to me. And she likes to sing Frozen, the Frozen song sometimes. <laughs> let it go, let it go. And she just chimes in and she... But I tell you, I had her there just recently on my lap and playing videos, the Christian songs. Uh, and I know like Ever Be, the second song Angela sang, she's heard Angela singing that a lot. And when she chimes in on Ever Be, I mean, it's cute. Cute. Let it go. Ever Be, it's spiritual. It's heavenly. It's wonderful. These are the things that are most important and eternal that we want to teach them and it's so great when you see your kids being taught these things it's so great when uh, there was earlier Richard and uh, Bob was here and his daughter Destiny and Juanita used to be there and it's so great when you see three and four generations of families that follow the Lord man what a legacy what a favor if you will that parents do by training their children <laughs> And what a great thing, a reward reaped by the child that honors and obeys. So, Father, we settle our hearts. And, Lord, we thank you for your grace, which covers a, a multitude of sins. And we all fall short. And I know I sure do, Lord. I don't come as one who has uh, done a perfect job at all in parenting. But I thank you that the investments made and the effort expended and the energy for Lisa and I, God, because of you invading our lives and rescuing us, have given us great reward. We thank you. We can say, along with the Bible, that our children are a great reward and that uh, they bless our hearts. 
and we're thankful. Lord, do a work in our lives for young parents, for kids. Lord, for those of us that are grandparents now and get to speak into a grandkids' lives, Lord, help us to tell the next generation and the next generation of your goodness. And Lord, we lift up uh, the building to you and ask for your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.